Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure today to introduce with us Richard Bell. He is a lawyer and the founding partner of Bell Alliance. He is well known for his 30 plus year career in real estate, wills, and estate planning. He's a frequent speaker on real estate and estate planning issues for professional and community organizations. We first interviewed him on our uh, podcast over five years ago, and we're lucky enough to have him back today to talk about financial planning documents and buying and selling in probate. Richard, welcome back. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Katie. Great. Well, thanks again for taking the time to be here. Uh, you have a wealth of knowledge. Um, and so I wanted to share a bit of that again today as it relates to these financial planning documents um, and again, buying or selling um, real estate in probate, because that can be a complex situation and, and one we come upon uh, in our business quite a bit with an aging population. So yes. maybe tell us a little bit about um, first, what are these key financial planning documents that you assist clients with and, and what should one have prepared? Yeah, there's really three key documents. And the big one, of course, is the will. Um, how is your estate distributed when you pass away? Uh, it's very important if you don't have a will, then there's provincial uh, legislation which sets what the distribution would be. And quite frankly, in many instances, that's not what the individual wants. So it really is critical to do that. Mm -hmm. The other two documents that we recommend certainly is what's called the power of attorney, which is appointing someone to manage your legal and financial matters and then a representation agreement, which is to appoint someone who can make healthcare decisions for the individual when they're unable to do that. So it's really, you know, we are often, you know, people come in, oh, I need my will. And our comment is, well, yes, absolutely. But you need these other things because what we know is bad things happen to somebody. And I always caution the clients that really just get it done now it's really the best thing you could do for your family and your loved ones. hundred percent. I, I know we did our family's wills with you. Uh, we were aware that my father was ill and even, even having all of those documents prepared, it was still a mountain of work. So I can't, I can't imagine going through that process when someone does pass, when you don't have those documents in place. Um, I, th I think the average or percentage is that 50% of Canadians do not have a will in place. Yeah, it's, that's sort of the number that we look at. And then when you look at these other personal planning documents like power of attorney and representation agreement, uh, you're probably pushing 75% who do not have those documents yeah. done. Um, and, you know, we really take the time to explain to our clients why that is so important. Um, and so I would think that sort of 90%, 99% of the clients we talk to really understand how significant doing those three documents is. You know, once you've got your power of attorney and representation agreement, when someone dies, everything then goes over to who is appointed as the executor under the will. Mm -hmm. So, and there's usually an alignment between the individual appointed on a power of attorney and who is the executor because of a transition from, you know, uh, near death to death. And, and so it's really important that all those documents are done at the same time. And it, again, just as my earlier comment, I always say that it's not about the individual I'm talking to, it's about their family and loved ones. It's so important to them to not leave chaos. Absolutely. I think you were quoted as saying last time in our in our podcast, the, you know, the only people who agree to be your executor are those who have not done it before, <laughs> which I can attest to. It is a mountain of work, but Maybe you could share a bit about what the duties are as an executor, if you're lucky enough to be appointed. Yeah, so, you know, really, um, the role initially is to deal with the deceased remains and, you know, make funeral arrangements, celebration of life and all of that. But you just picture uh, the gathering together of all the information that's necessary to be able to go through a process which is called probate. So, uh, an individual who's appointed as the executor needs to go through a probate process, which is getting a court order, which formally appoints them to be able to manage the estate. There's certain things they can do prior to the court order, including dealing with the remains 
and dealing with uh, the funeral instructions. But in terms of access to bank accounts and things like that, until the court formally appoints the individual, uh, you're not going to be able to walk into a bank and say, here's a death certificate, here's a will, here's my ID, please give me access to the funds. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, the probate process takes a little while. Uh, you're probably looking at sort of about 12 to uh, to 14 weeks to go through a probate process. Um, but it's really the gathering of all the information that takes most of, of the time. And quite frankly, what most executors do is they'll retain the services of an estate planning lawyer to help them mm -hmm. through that journey, as well as they can help them through the post-probate uh, journey too, which is what takes the greatest amount of time. But mm -hmm. it is a burden, and we certainly find that more and more individuals are looking for outside help to to assist in that process. Mm -hmm. Now, in that probate process, what do people need to know or be aware of if you are selling real estate or on the flip side, purchasing the real estate that is for sale? Yeah, so um, once uh, someone has passed away, the executor prior to probate does have the authority to list the property for sale. Okay. They cannot close on the sale transaction, but they can list it. So what the realtors will normally do, and it's usually bringing in lawyers as well that specialize in this area, is that if an offer is received, it will be subject to probate being finalized. Okay. And so that's sort of a, an important part of the process. Most people don't realize as an executor, they can start that process of sale. They just can't complete on the sale. Okay. So you'd have a, a, a term that would basically match to when probate has been received. You would just move that date forward. Yeah. And then there's some language that's pretty standard, which is, you know, at the end of the day, we think that the outside date is going to be this date. So it creates some certainty of contract. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're suggesting then they can list and then sell, but would you recommend you go through probate first and then sell? I guess it's circumstantial. Yeah, it really is circumstantial. It can speed the process up, obviously. And, you know, if you're talking about, you know, a hot spring market uh, yeah. where the market's going crazy and you're a little worried that maybe it'll slow down in the summer months when people decide to take holidays, mm -hmm. it may be the sort of the, the intelligent move is to let's get it listed, let's get the contract, and then uh, let's worry about getting probate uh, over the next few months. And so we'll frequently see people looking at what are the market conditions to assist them in making that decision? So for example, well, maybe you're not gonna list it if the death is in December. You might wait until probate is obtained and you're then gonna list it in the, the early spring market, for example. How do clients, I guess on either side, protect themselves in this process? Like other than the advice from the realtor, who else should they connect with to have advice as it relates to the selling of the real estate or buying of? Yeah, I think it's a combination of that realtor and a lawyer who actually plan, uh, practices in the estate planning area. The realtor and that, you know, what I what I love about the combination of people who work together, you know, us working with you, for example, and working with good realtors. I always say we get to work with the good people. Uh, <laughs> and hopefully that means we're pretty good at what we do as well. Um, and so it's really the team working together. Uh, that's what's really important. Uh, you know, it's it's funny because even the name of the law firm is based on that principle, the alliance of the various mm -hmm. professionals to help our clients. And uh, bringing the professionals in sooner than later is really important. I like that. So how does a sale under a power of attorney work? So if the individual is still here, can you access that if they're still here? Yeah, so a power of attorney is, it can only be used while the grantor of the, attorney, the power of attorney is alive. So um, in our powers of attorney, we always like to have a clause where the attorney could put the property into their name if necessary. Every few years, we have this challenge because that clause isn't in a power of attorney. So you have this scenario where someone's health is deteriorating fairly quickly. The power of attorney has listed the property. They get an offer. Closing is 45 days down the road. Um, but the... Uh, mm. dying person passes away mm -hmm. and now the power of attorney is no good. 
We would have loved to see that power of attorney includes a clause that says the attorney can put the property in their own name. So as the dying person's health starts to deteriorate even more, we can quickly flip the property into the attorney's name. The dying person does pass away before closing, but we can go ahead and then close the transaction because it's in the attorney's name. If it's not, the problem arises was what happens if after the death, the property values start to decline and mm -hmm. the buyer goes, well, you can't close on time. So now I can just step back. I'm not uh, obligated to close on this transaction. So again, this is where it's absolutely critical that the professional team is working together because the realtor is going to look at the power of attorney, ask the lawyer to review it. And the lawyer is going to go, oh my goodness, let's get that clause in there before yeah. we proceed too fast here. I find sometimes too spouses believe they can act on behalf of one another because they are legally married, yeah. but you can't without a power of attorney either. Like you, you still have to have that documentation in place. And I know we saw this back in my bank days where you'd have one spouse trying to sell another piece of real estate to help pay for care of their other partner. And they couldn't because they didn't have the right documentation in place. So yeah, it's usually, you know, where we frequently find it, where, you know, it may have been a couple that originally owned uh, the other spouse had predeceased, and, and then we've just got that 85, 95-year-old person going into care and the cells taking place. So, uh, again, it just, it speaks to what's the number one thing people should do is get the professional team together so yeah. that they're connected and acting as a group in the best interest of the client. Now, you've mentioned before, too, with these documents, there is a database where you can have documents registered. So if somebody's searching or if you're in an accident and, and there's medical professionals, they can search this database. Yeah. So there's an organization, not for profit called NIDAS, uh, where documents can be registered and you can register the will, the power of attorney and the representation agreement. The, gov the provincial government does have uh, under their, in, within the vital statistics group, they do have the ability to register the location of the will. Mm. Um, so that when someone does pass away and everyone's going, is there a will? We can't seem to find anything. Then that database can be searched to find out whether the will is held in a safety deposit box or in fact, at the lawyer's office who had worked with the clients on preparing their wills. We store virtually all of our clients' wills um, and we register with the Division of Vital Statistics just in case uh, someone doesn't know about us when a loved one passes away. Mm -hmm. I know too, from my bank days, some of the safety deposit boxes are going by the wayside. The, the cost of the real estate is <laughs> such that they're, they're building new branches without safety deposit boxes. So yeah, it's, I'm almost surprised when someone or what client tells me that they've got a safety deposit box <laughs> and I go, so why, what are you storing in there? Yeah. Uh, you know, is it gold? Uh, frequently, it's a little bit of gold. Yeah, <laughs> I tell you, no, no cash, <laughs> no cash or equivalent in your safety sure you deposit paid. box. <laughs> if there's cash in there, I'm sure you paid your taxes on yeah. it, right? Now, yeah. I've had my own experience in working with your firm professionally, personally. Um, you know, Bell Alliance is my top of the list for referrals. Um, and again, we're doing our own our own personal things as well. But um, you've just shared with me some exciting news about the firm. What, what if someone has not heard of Bell Alliance before, should they know and understand about working with you and your team? So um, I think it's, it's a, a little phrase we use when we're looking at how do we achieve the highest level of service for our clients? And it's how would you like your mother to be treated? Mm. And so man, you just can't get a higher standard of care than that. And, <laughs> and the beauty for us as a firm is, you know, sometimes something goes wrong on a file. And so I've had discussions with staff. I say, okay, yeah, I understand something's gone wrong. So if it was your mother, what should we do? Yeah. And all of a sudden the answer becomes pretty simple. Um, we are really focused as a community-based firm. You know, our tagline is a personal approach to law. Uh, we're involved in a number of community uh, charities and that. And so uh, for us, it's about family and friends and uh, and how can we help them on their journey. Um, so we do a number of different areas of state planning. Uh, 
um, corporate commercial work, uh, immigration, because when someone immigrates to Canada, odds are they're going to buy a property at some point and they're going to have to do their wills and estate plans. So it's really satisfying to help families on their journey. Uh, we often start with someone being a first time buyer and then we're doing their wills and estate planning and help them build a business if that's what they're looking at doing. So it's a, it's a great area, but yes, how would you like your mother to be treated is <laughs> it's a, that's a high standard. Well, personally, thank you for starting Bell Alliance and, and your continued excellent service. You treated my mother very, very well. So thank you. Uh, Richard, how does anyone reach you or your team if they have questions about any anything we've talked about or anything yeah. your team? You know, the best thing is go into bellalliance.ca. Uh, that'll tell a bit of our story and then uh, reach out to us uh, uh, and uh, we've got all the bios of the lawyers on there and talking about the different areas of practice. So uh, happy to hear from anyone and uh, with any issues. And and no, when someone phones us, we don't turn the clock on and start to start billing the hours. Uh, billing per second. <laughs> uh, we don't believe in that model. We actually, most of the work we do, we, we have a fixed pricing structure. So we're not saying, well, you know, it depends how much time and, you know, we just say, you know, here's what it's going to cost. And uh, and that makes people feel really comfortable just coming in to do the work. They know exactly what their costs are going to be. So, um, yeah, Excellent. happy to receive any contact that people would like to make. Excellent. Well, thank you again for your time. Truly appreciate it for everyone watching. Please feel free to reach out to Richard Bell Alliance um, or through me for a personal introduction. Thanks, Katie.